Hey everybody, welcome to the channel. Tonight we're going to be discussing the year 1973 and Led Zeppelin. That's right, the year Led Zeppelin ruled the planet. Now tonight's video is based on a couple of brand new articles that I was scouring on the internet. The first one being Roy Harper's account on the 1973 tour. He was there with Led Zeppelin as a part of their emotional support team. But tonight's video is also a bit inspired by an interview by Jimmy Page on their 1969 tour. And both of these time periods are very interesting for Led Zeppelin. Now, before we get started, I did want to give a shout out to Rachel's Ghost. Thanks, Rachel. She gave me a big shout out on her channel today. I always try to show up there when I can. She starts at 6 a.m. on the West Coast so that she can pick up audiences on the East Coast and, well, well into Europe. But they discuss everything from vinyl to the music that's on those vinyls and, well, a plethora of other things. So give that channel a peruse if you would. Now, let's get back to Led Zeppelin. So first of all, what I want to do is do a recap. I've done videos on their 1969 tour. That was the tour where they finally ended up after a horrible drive from north to south to get to LA. There they played the Whiskey A Go Go and had lots of interesting contact with the musicians there. And that's where they started rethinking their entire presence on stage, their approach to stage and everything else. And as I've stated before in other videos, by the time they got to San Francisco to play the Fillmore West, they took that city by storm. And of course, the tour culminating in New York City on the Fillmore East. Now on that tour, the band also played Memphis, Tennessee, didn't they? And when they did that, they were given the keys to the city. Now think about that. This is their first tour of America. Peter Grant had to send white label versions of their album to various radio stations and executives so that they could get a taste of just what this band was about. A lot of bands were fed up with them opening for them. They were showstoppers in every sense of the word. And Memphis gave them the keys to the city. Now, Jimmy talks about how he really wanted to record at Sun Records, but uh, evidently they didn't know the band from Adam and they were declined. But he also stated that at the end of the concert, both him and Robert had noticed that people weren't leaving. This is something that would happen more and more on this tour. They were gathering and converting crowds all within one performance. So him and Robert thought, hey, let's go out and give an encore. As they turned to leave the dressing room, some burly assed cop barred their way there and said, you go out there, boy, I'm going to bust your head. I mean, imagine that. They got the key of the city. I mean, that's given by the mayor, right? And the police should be his subordinates. But evidently, there was some sort of snafu in communications between the morons and the head moron of the city. Now, this isn't the first time that the mishaps on that tour happened with Led Zeppelin, but mishaps from the very officials that gave them the key to the city is just absolutely unforgivable to me. I mean, as far as the road goes and performing live, this band did it much better than the Beatles ever thought they could. They played extended sets. They'd open for people. They'd close for people. Big, long encores. These guys gave their very central nervous system for what they knew was not only just a great band, they knew that the first time they played, but they did everything in their power to make sure you and I knew it as well, didn't they? Now, fast forward to 1973. Roy Harper's there, again, as I said, as part of their emotional support team, and he said that was the year that Led Zeppelin 
became a monster. All right, so I've pulled up the article here on screen and I'm gonna turn and read just a bit of this. This is from Roy Harper himself. Here he states, they pulled the crowd because of the bite, the sheer bite of that. It became a thing, a walking, talking monster. And as the venues got bigger, they got better, heavier, because they could exercise control. Now he goes on to say this, it was a kind of magic and you were blasted into the middle of next week. You paid attention because attention was being demanded. That wasn't the same as being in England. You couldn't have pulled that off in the Marquee Club. Can you imagine? You know, most of you know I'm a huge Led Zeppelin fan. They are my second favorite band of all time, just barely beneath the Beatles. This band actually evolved as the stadiums got bigger and they took advantage of that. Now let's go back a few years here. The Shea Stadium, the Beatles invent Stadium Rock at that moment, as far as I'm concerned. But how prepared were they for that? Well, first of all, they had to use the PA from Shea Stadium. A horrible, horrible sounding megaphone-like PA system, right? And Vox, what did they do to prepare for this? Well, they built 100 watt amps for the Beatles. Now, a 100 watt amp for a club is overpowered. For a smaller outdoor event of maybe a hundred to a thousand people, maybe too much power. But on that level, they were severely hampered by their own equipment or the lack of equipment, thus using the damn PA system. But here we see Led Zeppelin, and dig this, on that first tour in 69, they were sent over without their manager. No Peter Grant to hold their hands and mischief was abound, but we got a band that learned the ropes, took advantage of every single thing, and they never stopped no matter what tour. They just got sharper, better, more inventive, and everything else that you could possibly think of them needing to do to become the mighty airship Led Zeppelin. Now, John Paul Jones was also stated recently as saying that the reason that Led Zeppelin did so well compared to other bands was they were the first band to come out with three hit them in your face heavy rock songs with a lot of guitar work. Other bands would do this intermittently throughout their show. Led Zeppelin just let us have it right between the eyes. Now, at the bottom of this article, the writer also rated Led Zeppelin's albums. And I've been hinting, I'm going to do a brand new video rating these albums. I've already done a video that has done that. But you know what? This was when the channel was first starting up. And I did that video based basically on my memories and what I thought were my current preferences. I followed that by doing a video on all their albums up through Coda, the studio albums, and during the course of that and further listenings of these bands, I'm going to retackle that whole thing because you know what? After a solid year of listening to this band, probably more than I have in the last five years, I've got some other thoughts on the whole matter. But dig this. This clown rated Physical Graffiti as the eighth best studio album by Led Zeppelin, barely beating Presence. Now, I'm one of those people who do not think that Presence was a bad album or their weakest album. It needs to be bumped up on a lot of lists if you ask me. But you know what? Listing Physical Graffiti as the eighth best Led Zeppelin album is akin to listing the Beatles' wide album as, well, it's not quite as good as Let It Be. Now, my point is here, folks, these ratings, you know, a lot like the Rolling Stone ratings, they fluctuate over the years. But you know what, as far as I'm concerned, this is blatant disrespect and a list 
by somebody who obviously is, first of all, not a fan of Led Zeppelin, and second of all, didn't give the album a listen to. So I'll be doing my reassessment videos on how to rank these albums, and I've got a couple of twists I'll throw in there for you as well. Make it real interesting. All right, folks, that's my video for tonight. If you enjoyed it, please give it a thumbs up. Like I've said many times before, when you do that, that helps the YouTube algo dragon better do its damn job, right? And the channel grows, and thus the tribe grows. You know, the real action of this channel has always been in the comments. We get tons of comments, and I do my best to respond to as many as I possibly can. I usually put two to four hours trying to answer the comments, but the comments keep coming and there is a time where I have to shut that down and get on to my next video. All right, I'm Michael Noland. This is The Bottom Line. Again, as I see it, folks, I wanna hear your views. And you know what? Together, you and I, we are the tribe. And I'll see you in my next video. Mm -hmm.